getting started. Jindo Brakakov. Yes, then the Varenson. He she how them or the we a ditch them or acrimen. Zrobia Popo and Gels. A little rusty with that one because I only added those few sentences today. I haven't practiced them as much as the others. Before we get into what is Acrimen, you may be wondering, who am I? I'm a developer, like most of you, with about three and a half decades of experience. For the past several years, I've been the T-Rex, yes, that's my real job title, of Kodosaurus, my little one-man consultancy, which explains how I can get such a cool title. But don't worry, this is not a sales pitch. <laughs> Thank you for ducking, Jim. <laughs> But it is a test drive of sorts of some material I'm hoping to work up into a training course that I can charge for. I'm also a member of TopTal, a consulting network of senior developers, designers, project managers, and so forth. In particular, I'm a member of their speakers network, which helps me prepare and practice this presentation. Feel free to ask me about them later, and right there is my referral link, in case you want to join. <coughs> but I am not speaking on their behalf. I'm the only one to blame for these crazy ideas. Speaking of which, enough about me, let's start this Ackerman stuff with a poll, I mean, a question. Who here likes low quality software? Anyone? Anyone? Nobody? <laughs> okay, one smart ass. Let's try another question, though. Raise your hand and give a loud cheer because the camera's pointed up here. If you have written any low quality software, <laughs> yeah, I, know I sure have. That's more like it. For those of you who raised a hand, congratulations. As they say in the 12 step recovery programs, step number one is to realize you have a problem. For the rest of you, Welcome to software development. I hope you enjoy this career you've just started. So, we've got a lot of people writing low quality software and we don't like it. So, it seems pretty clear that we need more software quality. But that just leads us to one little question. What is it? If we don't have a good definition, we can hope to improve even our own quality, let alone advance the state of the whole part. There have been some previous attempts to define software quality, but most have been mainly, if not only, from the point of view of us developers, and they resulted in long lists of complicated terms full of jargon. Now, jargon is fine for talking amongst ourselves, but I wanted something that other people would understand, even non-technical people so that they can understand better what we do and give us more precise feedback about exactly how our software sucks. Do we have any non-technical people in the room? Okay, I guess we can speak freely. To make it understandable, I zoomed out from down in the weeds where we developers tend to live up to about low Earth orbit. So I was looking at the continents, not Pebbles. That let me boil it down to just six aspects with simple names and relatively simple explanations, and taking into account not only the developer point of view, but others as well, mainly the users who will be using our software, the customers who will be paying for it, or not necessarily the same people, and our colleagues, again, not just us developers, but also management from immediate to senior, QA, customer support, and so forth. And I call this set of aspects Acrumen. So what does that mean? Originally, it was a Latin word meaning sour fruit, like lemons, limes, and grapefruit. I understand you don't say this in Polish, but in English, we use the term lemon to denote something of unexpectedly low quality. You may remember the Trabant or the Yugo cars of the communist era. 
everybody knew those were of low quality, so those weren't exactly lemons. But suppose you bought a Volvo or a Honda, generally very reliable cars, but yours won't start and falls apart. That is a lemon. So life hands us lemons by the bushelful, often in the form of low quality software. And I'm taking those lemons and making delicious lemonade in the form of this training. So what do I mean by acrimen? The acronym acrimen, try saying that 10 times fast, simply takes those aspects and puts them in priority order. By now you're probably wondering, so what are the blankety blank aspects already? They are at long last. That software should be appropriate, correct, robust, usable, maintainable, and efficient. But what does that all mean? First and foremost, it needs to do what the stakeholders need it to do. In other words, do it the right job. Once that's been identified, of course, we need to do that job right. Then come three that are fairly fuzzy, but I'm going to wrap some more solid definitions around them. It should be hard to make the software misbehave, and in particular, I'm going to define behaving but it should be easy for the users to use it and for us developers to change it. Not so much the other way around. And last, dead last despite what a pedestal we developers tend to put this on, it must make efficient use of resources. Now you may have noticed that the opening slide said there were six aspects. I said I boiled it down to six aspects. I've got six aspects listed there. But Hackerman has seven letters. Does anybody have any guesses what the N stands for? Anybody who doesn't already know? <laughs> All right, it stands for nothing. I just tacked it on to make a real word. Now, before we get into the details, I've made a special treat just for DevConf Poland. Aspecti Popolsku. Opogramovanie Ovino Beach. Vwaschiva opravna odporne praktichne uchimavarne i vidaina. Many fine thanks to the Poland channel of the TopTel Slack group for helping me fine tune the wording and pronunciation. And no, I'm not going to try to pronounce the rest of that. Now that we've gotten an overview, let's dive into the details. Keep in mind, though, that even if we had all week, we could barely scratch the surface of these aspects. In some cases, it would take all year. Now, to illustrate the importance of being appropriate, let's try a little thought experiment. Suppose you want a program to play checkers, or for those of you speaking British English, drafts. And I write for you the world's greatest chess play program. It's as correct, robust, usable, maintainable, and efficient as anyone could ever possibly want. But are you going to be happy with it, you think? No. That's right, you're probably not. But why not? It's a great program. What's wrong with it? <laughs> the problem is it's not what you asked for. It's not checkers or crafts, whatever. <coughs> or in Ackerman terms, it's not appropriate. So this shows that appropriateness is not only more important than any one of the other aspects, but it's more important than all the rest of them combined. And yet, we developers are generally not taught that this is even a thing, let alone one that we need to be thinking about. So now that we know how important it is, how do we achieve it? Ideally, we could bring in the experts. In this case, that would be requirements analysts. But on this planet, we generally don't have that luxury, at least outside of huge companies. But instead, we can use one of their main tools and go talk to the stakeholders, ideally face-to-face -face or as close to it as you can get. Hi, how you doing? <laughs> Ask what they want and keep breaking it down into smaller and smaller pieces. 
Big developers are generally good at that. It's what programming is really all about at the basic level. But go a little further and ask why they want each thing. That will get a good handle on what they really need, which is what we need to satisfy. Once we've got a decent grasp of that, we can show the mock-ups and prototypes of what we're going to do and demos of what we have done. Ideally, do these periodically. This gives them a chance to correct our wrong ideas of what they need. Anything from, oh, that logo needs to be a little lighter shade of blue and two pixels to the left, to, oh, that's not how the process works. That piece of it needs to be done at least three screens ago may need to rejigger the whole application. That will keep us from going too far down the wrong rabbit hole. Anybody been there? Okay, I see a bunch of nodding heads for the benefit of the camera. There's another thing though that I'll be returning to over and over over the course of this presentation. We can propose tests. In particular, I recommend the given when then format, which is Given these preconditions, usually something like records existing in the database or not, when this happens, usually some kind of user input, then this is the result, usually something the user sees on the screen. This makes a great link between the worlds of business and technology because usually they can understand it pretty easily and we can turn it into a test. That brings us to the next aspect, correctness. Nothing can actually stop us from writing code that isn't correct. But so long as the bugs don't make it into production, it isn't really that big a deal, though of course the sooner we catch them, the better. So our code may have bugs, so the real question is, just like the thermos, or for those of you speaking British English, the doer flask, it keeps hot things hot and cold things cold. How do we know? Any guesses how we know? Okay, I mentioned just a moment ago, tests. Tests prove whether or not our code is correct, at least assuming that our tests are any good, which is a whole different ball of wax. Ideally, our tests are automated, which makes them faster, more reliable, cheaper than manual tests, and gets us vital feedback while the problem at hand is still fresh in our minds. Assuming, of course, that our tests are reasonably efficient. Not always the case. We can start with the tests that the stakeholders approve for the sake of appropriateness. These are likely high-level tests, like end-to-end -end system tests and occasional feature tests. But that doesn't mean that we're off the hook for low-level tests, like unit tests and integration tests. We need to have enough coverage of various kinds of tests to have strong confidence in the correctness of our code. Some people say, you know, oh, I've got to have 100%. Eh, not necessarily, but it's a good goal to strive for. Next comes the first of the three fuzzy aspects, robustness. My brief definition was that it's hard to make the software misbehave, but what does that even mean? There are a few other ideas but the vast majority of what I mean by this, what I mean by behaving robustly, is covered by a core concept of information security, the CIA triad. Now, it's nothing to do with spies and gangsters. It's this triangle you see here of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. So robust software does not reveal information when it's not supposed to, change information when it's not supposed to, or become unavailable when it's not supposed to. Now, some people would also add it shouldn't become available when it's not supposed to, but so long as it doesn't violate either of the other two, it's not as big a deal. It might be a resource drain, but that's further down the list as a matter of efficiency rather than robustness. Uh, there may be times when certain security precautions are only available during certain times, and if your system becomes available unexpectedly at other times, then yes, that could be a real robustness violation. Anyway, what makes it really hard 
is that a robust system needs to uphold these principles even if someone's trying to force it to violate them. So, another tall order. How do we achieve all that? Once again, we can bring in the experts. And in this case, that would be penetration testers, or for short, pen testers. The good news is you don't have to work for a huge company to use them. A huge company may have their own, but there are many pen testers working at small, independent computer security companies that you can hire on a contract. They're great for testing entire corporate networks or large systems or very sensitive systems, especially ones that provide security functionality to other things such as a data guard or a firewall. But they are probably overkill for most of the projects that most of us will be working on. They tend to be rather expensive. They can disrupt normal operations because they pretty much have to test your production system. They normally don't report every little thing where your system may be a bit weak, just the things that were used in a successful chain of attack. And they're usually called on after the system is complete, or at least we think it is rather than being an ongoing part of the process, which I think would be more ideal. But once again, we can use some of their tools, especially software such as static analyzers, which simulate the execution of your program and figure out the possible range of values that your variables can have. Fuzzers that test your program's reaction to various kinds of invalid input and probes which test your system for vulnerability to specific known attacks. Many of these are available as open source. Even without these software tools, though, we can go a long way with their mindset. And the foundation of that is to ask ourselves, what could go wrong? And here the tone of voice is very important. It's not, what could go wrong, as though we think nothing can, but almost statement-like. What could go wrong? I know a lot can, I'm just trying to list it out. I don't need a demonstration, thank you very much. For instance, if the system needs a user to supply a file name, they could type it wrong. Or they could type correctly the name of a file they don't have access to. Or there could be all kinds of external factors like loss of the power connection or the network connection at their end or ours or some third party service we're relying on. That may sound like a lot, but we're just getting started. This sort of thinking is mainly about innocent mistakes and mishaps. To make it really robust, we must make it secure, which means we have to think like an attacker. We must ask ourselves, what are the system's weak points? What can an attacker make happen that can get them just one tiny step closer to their goal? And in what unusual ways can someone get information into or out of our system? Once we run out of answers to those questions, then for everything we've listed, we must handle it. Yes, I know that's extremely vague, but how to handle something is going to vary very widely according to just what it is. If the user types a bad file name, just ask them for another one, no problem. But if the system detects that there's an attack in progress and data is being corrupted, the proper response may well be to shut the whole thing down and not bring it back up until somebody physically enters the data center and pushes the big button. In between, there are all kinds of things we can do. <clears throat> we could try to make the situation impossible or at least much more, much less likely to happen or we can look at exactly what the negative consequences are. Maybe we can isolate them, counteract them, recover from them, or at least lessen them somehow. But whatever response we decide on, we must test it, as it is now a very important part of the system. Our next aspect is usability. This one is even fuzzier because now I'm redefining a word that is in somewhat common use already. If we Google usability, we'll probably find mostly things about making sure that people with various physical challenges can use our software about as well as everyone else. In other words, access. 
accessibility. That's a great goal, but I'm going to add on to make usability, and it should be easy for everyone, not just more or less equally difficult. So to start defining it, it should be clear at all times what the user can do, should do, and of course must do, and how they can do it, and what else the system can do for them, especially any help facilities. And all of that should be easy, despite any challenges the user may be facing. We can start with the ones usually addressed under accessibility, like poor to no vision or color vision, my own main challenge, hearing or fine motor control in order to use a mouse or trackpad or touch screen. But there are other challenges we should be aware of, like lack of literacy, at least in our character set, like if I tried to use an interface in Japanese, or even lack of intelligence. Yes, we may joke about stupid users from time to time, but statistically, about half of them are going to be probably below average. There may even be external factors, like a noisy or shaky environment. Imagine using a mobile app on a small phone, standing up on a crowded metro bus in downtown rush hour traffic. Accurate tapping is just not happening. And if that weren't enough, all software should be usable, whether it's a web application, a mobile application, a desktop graphical application, or a command line app, or an API. Whether it functions, whether it works through function calls like a library or framework, or a wire protocol, whether binary or textual or whatever. You say goodbye. Okay. Thought I had it muted. Whatever. Sorry. So, how do we achieve all this? Once again, we can ideally bring in the experts. But remember, we're redefining this term. So, if we bring in usability experts, we're likely to get really accessibility experts. The good news is that we have a wide range of professions we can choose from that can really help us a lot with this. <clears throat> we would be well served by a user experience expert or at least a user interface expert. Even a web designer or an old fashioned print graphic designer has a lot of training on how to make things like, easy to see what's what and they can look organized. Uh, in terms of general principles of useful practical design. Sometimes though, in fact, the majority of the time in my experience, we have to still go it alone. We can get a long way ourselves by applying those very same principles. For instance, here we see an application of the KISS principle, which stands for keep it simple, stupid, or if you don't want to be so negative, keep it super simple. Notice the simplicity of the stereotypical apps from two companies with reputations for simple ease of use to highly successful companies, and then the cluttered, unusable mess from your company. Now, we may have some Apple or Google employees here or companies that are similarly successful, but chances are pretty good that your company is not as successful as those. Also, depending upon exactly what we're doing, where and for whom, there may be regulations we have to follow. For instance, in the USA, most government website park requires compliance with certain accessibility standards. If the software is something we can use ourselves, then by all means do so, or as we say in the USA, eat our own dog food or dog food it. But remember, if we found it easy to use, that does not mean our users will. We have inside knowledge that helps a lot. However, if there's anything we found difficult or unclear, it will be even worse for our users. So dog fooded mainly to find the pain points. Lastly, it may not be as definable and quantifiable 
but a good user interface can still be tested. You knew I had, I had to go there eventually. We can bring in some of our typical users and have them accomplish typical tasks with our software. Then ask them, what did you find difficult or easy? What did you find obvious or unclear? Fix their pain points, do more of the good parts, and lather, rinse, repeat. Next, we have the last of the fuzzy aspects, maintainability. I think we'd all agree that the basic concept is that maintainable software is easy to change. But I'm going to put some additional requirements on it, that it's easy to change with low fear of error and low chance. Excuse me, low chance of error and low fear of error, even for a novice programmer who is also new to our project. So how do we do all that? For better or worse, the vast majority of software engineering advice is aimed squarely at this. So I'm just going to pick two principles, fairly basic ones, that go together very well, and our old standby. First up is good names. You may have heard that there are only two hard things in computer science. Cache invalidation, naming things, and off by one errors. Though very simple in concept, naming things is obviously very hard to do given the number of very bad names out there. As, have any of you encountered a vague or misleading name in software you've had to work on? Uh, I see only one shake and a lot of nods, okay. If we give something a misleading or vague name, anything from you know, a file to a single variable, whatever, then the next poor sucker to have to work on that code, who may well be us, will have to spend a lot of their mental energy figuring out and then remembering what name in the code refers to what concept in the domain, instead of solving the actual problem at hand. So don't inflict that on them, or us. Do the extra typing and call something a subscription or whatever, rather than a sub, which could be a subtitle, a submarine, a subcutaneous hematoma, who knows? <laughs> the next principle is the single responsibility principle. Just like a Unix command line utility, everything in your system down to, again, a single variable, module, whatever, should do exactly one thing, and ideally do it well. If it's doing multiple things, then not only does that reduce the chances that it's doing any of them well, but it's also harder to reason about, because any use or modification to it is going to have to juggle multiple goals that may be in conflict. One way to tell if something is violating the single responsibility principle is to go back to good names. Try to give it a good name, ideally one word, maybe three, about five at most. If it's very hard to get the name that short, or here's the big tip off, if that has to include the word and, then it may be doing too much and need to be broken up. Lastly, we have our good old friend, testing. Writing a test for whatever it is you're trying to do, like add a feature, fix a bug, whatever, will obviously reduce the chance of bugs making it into production. But also, all your past tests from all the prior features added and bugs fixed become a regression test suite that will catch anything you break that used to work. This will like, progress at a quick pace with a clear mind, rather than tiptoeing carefully through the code base, being worried that you're going to break something accidentally and not find out until the users start to complain. That's not a good place to be. And that's why I mentioned fear at all. For the final aspect, software should make efficient use of resources. Mainly we know of technical resources like the CPU and memory, 
network bandwidth, disk space, disk I.O., screen space. It's one that's been annoying me lately. Little side rant, please don't make your app that should function just fine this wide demand to be this wide just because my monitor can go this wide. Thank you. But there are also non-technical resources that we should be aware of, mainly things like the user's attention span and patience and brain power to figure, to figure things out with, and the company's money. The user items are mostly affected by usability issues, so those will usually be caught higher up the stack. The company's money can be drained by all kinds of problems that could be caught elsewhere. But I believe these other non-technical aspects are other, other non-technical resources are worth keeping in mind as well. So how do we achieve efficiency? Now, have any of you ever written a piece of code and run it, and it's slow? You stare at the code, look at a piece of looks like it's probably where it's really slow. You spent hours, possibly even days, optimizing that little chunk of code. You run it again, and it's still slow. Anybody? Yeah, I'm seeing some nods out there. Okay. Well, don't do that. Measure it instead. Turns out people are not really very good at spotting the inefficiencies. Don't ask me why somebody's putting calipers on the sandwich. <laughs> there are profilers and packet capture programs and all kinds of other things that will tell us exactly where, or at least when, we're using too much CPU or memory or network bandwidth or whatever. Once we've found the problem, though, how do we fix it? Usually the problem is a bad algorithm. Maybe we're using some approach that's got quadratic runtime. It's proportional to the square of the size of the input set. When there might be an alternate way to solve the problem that might be only directly proportional, linear, or proportional to the logarithm of the size of the input set. So, in order to spot such opportunities to substitute something better, we need to be familiar with the basic common data structures and algorithms and how to analyze and compare their runtime complexity and combine them into larger structures such as design patterns and other things that may be supplied by your language or framework. That way we can use solutions that have stood the test of time, possibly even been tested and optimized in their actual implementation. Once it's fast enough, we can slap a performance test on it to ensure we don't have that kind of regression. Also, there are times when we want to use more of one resource to use less of another. The classic examples are using a little more memory to cache the results of a an expensive computation or something we have to fetch from another system, such as a database server. But sometimes we should use more memory and CPU to spare resources such as elapsed time and user patience. This is the driver behind things like multitasking, techniques such as concurrency and parallelism. These let us make use of technical resources that would otherwise have sat idle. And that idleness would have been inefficient. For instance, suppose we have a web application that generates a report. The user can read it there online or download a PDF. But the PDF takes a few minutes to generate. Don't make the user sit and wait through the PDF generation. We can put the PDF requests in a queue and let the users go on about their business. We can generate the PDFs in the background, or possibly even in an overnight batch run if it's low enough priority. If the system has any kind of messaging built in, we can send the user a message with a link to the PDF, 
Better yet, if we have their email addresses, we can send them links to their PDFs, excuse me, send them their PDFs, delete our copies, and save our disk space. That was the last of the aspects. So, in conclusion, if our software is appropriate, correct, robust, usable, maintainable, and efficient, then nobody should be sour about the fruits of our labors. Just to keep everything legal, there are the image credits. Now I don't expect you to read those. And now it's your turn. If you have any questions, I'll take them now. Later you can give me feedback about the concept or the presentation or whatever, or tell me if you would like to pay for some deeper training on this. My contact information is up there. Long. One last shout out to TopTown, and I'll be around for a while. Any questions? Uh, I guess everything was perfectly clear. <laughs> How do you go about using this when you're either writing or reviewing code, like something that we'll typically do on a regular basis where we're writing, committing stuff, and going to look at other piece. So how do you apply it there? Well, one thing I'm hoping people will do with this is use it as basically a checklist. Is this doing the right job? Is this doing the job right? Is this um, maintainable and usable and so forth? Do you, do you personally keep like a checklist as you're doing it? Like actually on a piece of paper where you're marking off things or is it just a mental checklist that you use? Uh, so far just a mental checklist. And I don't always remember to fully do it, especially since uh, the usability stuff is more front end and um, mostly back end. But uh, at least as regards any uh, classes and whatnot, that someone else might use, uh, try to keep even usability in mind. So what set you off on, on this topic? Good question. One of the things that we consultants are often advised to do is teach. I sat down and thought, hmm, okay, what should I teach? Well, I'm not going to try to compete with all those boot camps teaching Ruby on Rails. I'm not going to compete with all the colleges teaching Java. I don't know if they still are or that's passe or what, but uh, I'm not going to compete with all these training companies that are teaching you know, Python, C Sharp, whatever. So, hmm. What does that leave? And that got me thinking, about, okay, what's my unique selling proposition, as we consultants say? Or in other words, when I put on my shining armor and ride my white horse off to rescue a fair project in distress, what makes this night different from all other nights? And one of the things I came up with was that I've always prided myself on the quality of my code. Well, what does that even mean? So the light bulb kind of went off that, hey, if I could define that, maybe I could teach that. So I set about trying to break it down to a manageable number of reasonably simple aspects that I could explain to us techies and to non-techies as well so that they might at least see some value in hiring me to train their people on it. So you put that at the beginning of your talk? Oh, that's an idea. Do you uh, give lemons to all of your clients? I feel like that should be the thing to do. Well, uh, I have considered giving them like a, a little box of lemon drops or something, but uh, I have not had new clients since coming up with this. At least not since coming up with this particular acronym. I've had previous versions that were uh, trying to find uh, a good way to put it in order and everything. The best I came up with previously was you scream. 
had some of this stuff about do you scream at your software? <laughs> Instead, do you scream at your software? And this is better. Yes, <laughs> much better, especially since it's in priority order. You scream was not. It's uh, usability, security, robustness, efficiency, appropriateness, and maintainability. And then it kind of all scrambled. And then when I started trying to define, okay, what's really the difference between security and robustness? Um, most of it boiled down to on purpose versus by accident. So I smushed them together. Like I said, there were a few other things that I consider lack of robustness aside from insecurity, but security is the vast majority of it. Anything else? All right, that's 40 and a half minutes. <laughs> <laughs>